Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Osasu Show. According to the Nigerian Population Commission, the amount of IDPs has increased by 4.5% in 2018. Over 2 million people across Nigeria are currently internally displaced. On today's program, we speak to the Chairman House Committee on Internally Displaced Persons, Refugees and Initiatives on the Northeast. Don't go anywhere and we'll be right back on the Osasu Show. Not Too Young to Run is a campaign which seeks to reduce the age limit for running for elected office in Nigeria and globally. The campaign started in support of bills and motions in Nigeria's National Assembly sponsored by the Tony Wulu in the House of Representatives and Abdulaziz Nyako in the Senate. The bill was passed by the National Assembly last year to alter Section 605, 105, 131, 177 of the Constitution. The campaign is now global, symbolized by the hashtag Not Too Young to Run, and has been signed into law by President Muhammad Buhari. Today is a significant day for all of us in Nigeria, and most especially our young people, and draw the play in our democracy, politics, and national life. We are gathered here for the signing of the Not Too Young to Run Bill, a landmark piece of legislation that was conceived, championed, and accomplished by young Nigerians. The coordinators of the Not Too Young to run movement have now established a formidable legacy, which is that in our maturing democracy, if you really want to change something in Nigeria, and if you can organize yourself and work hard towards it, you can achieve it. <laughs> the outcome of such efforts is this remarkable feat. These efforts have resulted in the heroic task of enshrining in law a reduction of the minimum ages for election for elective office in Nigeria. A. Eligible age for aspirants for members of the state houses of assembly will be reduced from 30 to 25 years. B. Eligible age for aspirants for members of the Federal House of Representatives will be reduced from 30 to 25 years. And C, eligible age for aspirants for office of the President will be lowered from 40 to 35 years. <laughs> Surprisingly, the age limits for senators and governors was not reduced <laughs> as originally proposed by the sponsors of this bill. This is an issue that may need to be addressed going forward. <laughs> this, thus, it may be tempting for you to think of this as the end of the journey. However, it is always the beginning. This is because 
Today is about preparing for the bright future of our country. I am confident each one of you will transform Nigeria in your own way, whether through media, agriculture, enterprise, economists, engineers, or as lawmakers in your state or at federal levels, or as state governors, and even someday as president. Why not? <laughs> but please, but please, can I ask you to postpone your campaign <laughs> till after 2019 election? <laughs> Finally, let me say how proud I am and how proud the entire country is of what you have accomplished. Congratulations and best of luck with continuing to work to make Nigeria a greater country for us and future generations of Nigerians. God bless all the young people of Nigeria Amen. and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Honorable Sani Zor, Chairman House Committee on Internally Displaced Persons, Refugees and Initiatives on Northeast. Thank you so much for joining me on today's program. Thank you very much for having me, Osasa. You're most welcome. Yeah. Honorable, the amount of internally displaced persons has mm. increased by 4.5% according to the Nigerian Population mm. Commission. Mm. That's about 2 million persons in Nigeria are internally displaced. Mm. What is your committee doing to perform oversights that ensures the rehabilitation and the resettlement of these IDPs back to their communities? Well, first of all, it is really a pity that over the last uh, four or five years, we have been competing with Syria and Iraq as far as the, the percentage of uh, internally displaced persons you know, is concerned. But to answer your question specifically, our committee is the main committee that deals with humanitarian affairs in terms of oversight in the National Assembly. And uh, we have been doing all our best to see how the executive arm of government, because it is the executive arm of government that owns the agencies that deal with the issue of internal displacement, refugees, and the government initiatives on the Northeast. So we have been trying to get them coordinated. Well, um, these days they have the technical working group that has seen them working together, or they have started to work together. But I'm afraid that oversight in these agencies, I must admit, has not been easy because the issue of accountability is something that is very uh, scarce over there. Now, I, I suspect very much that um, um, uh, chief executives of agencies, especially in that sector, are reluctant to come to account because of so many reasons. First of all, um, because Nigeria is experiencing massive internal displacement maybe for the very first time since the civil war between 67 and 70. So there is a lot of inexperience. Otherwise, in countries that have witnessed this sort of phenomenon, be it Sudan, Niger, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Uganda, and name them, within Africa, most of them have dedicated ministries of humanitarian affairs or something like ministries of resettlement and so on. But we don't have that in Nigeria. Mm. And uh, lest we forget, the internal displaced persons, internally displaced persons that we have in this country are not just the ones from the Northeast. It's all over. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you go to the North Central, for instance, we have witnessed, or we have continued to witness clashes between Jukun and, uh, you know, thieves. Mm -hmm in Taraba and neighboring Benue states for so many years. So you have IDPs stationed in Makodi for more than five years. Are there any budgetary yes. provisions for these internally displaced persons? Yes, they live on handouts and the assistance provided by host communities mostly. But if we are talking of structural response, you know, to these issues, it is the government 
basically through the National Emergency Management Agency and the National Commission for Refugees. And then, you know, on the sidelines, there are some non-governmental organizations and charities that extend food and non-food items to them. And then, International Committee for the Red Cross, and then the World Food Program. In fact, the World Food Program feeds not less than 70% of the IDPs in the Northeast. This is the truth. Because the resources committed, you know, through the agencies are just not enough. Mm. The entire budget for the Presidential Committee on Northeast Initiative is 45 billion naira. Mm. I'm not sure if in the course of 2017 they have gotten maybe 50% of such releases, I'm not sure. Mm. And this goes solely yeah. to aid, so for food, uh, healthcare material and not anything to do with infrastructural development no. and rebuilding their homes. No. So that means mm. that these IDPs who are looking to return home as soon as possible mm. is practically impossible. No, it's impossible. Unfortunately, it's impossible because government has not taken the right and adequate steps. In fact, it's not looking in that direction. Now, there are three ways of uh, settling or resettling internally displaced persons. And this is according to the international guidelines on international, uh, sorry, of, of IDPs. And these guidelines were developed by the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs of the United Nations. First of all, you make efforts to return internally displaced persons to their ancestral homes in security and dignity. Right now, there is no security to return them back to. Then shelter. You must also be able to provide shelter that is at least up to the standard of you know, internally displaced persons and generally respect their human rights. The human rights of internally displaced persons. And unfortunately, and, we don't yes. see that in Nigeria. No, we don't. That, and that is the crisis. What we are now witnessing, the disputation between Amnesty International and members of the armed forces and all those other groups that criticize Amnesty International, for instance, over the report it turned out, has to do with the in, you know, human rights of IDPs. Honing in on that report, yeah. the Amnesty International released a report based on the human rights violations accusing yeah. the Nigerian army of raping, starving, yeah. internally displaced persons yeah. in exchange for food yes. um, across the IDP camps um, in Nigeria. Yeah. Has the, your committee hmm. co um, conducted an independent investigation into these allegations? Well, not, not on this uh, very matter, but uh, let me see, in the course of the last two years, we have had so many referrals, including complaints of sex for food. And there is no doubt about the fact that that is the character. That's what characterizes camps of internally displaced persons and refugees all over the world. One other issue also that creeps in is drug trade, drug abuse in the camps. And then you have so many pregnancies that you cannot account for. And definitely, whether in Nigeria or anywhere else, you know, those who administer the camps are often found guilty of the rape and uh, uh, gender-based violence, you know, and all other atrocities that happen in the camp. And that is why, according to the guidelines on, internally, uh, on, on internal displacement, as much as possible, the character of internally displaced persons camps should be civilian, civilian character. As much as possible, you should not have soldiers, policemen, and so on. But that's what we have, because the work of the members of the armed forces and other paramilitary forces, you know, are also required to provide security in those places. Mm. So normally, there is a need for coordination and understanding, you know, to make sure that there is no friction and everyone respects himself. It seems to me that the legislators yes. who are um, supposed to perform these oversight mm. uh, amongst these uh, IDPs are helpless in the sense that mm. there isn't much progress we're seeing from yeah. your end. Um, why is that? Yes, um, for instance, uh, you are right, because I can give you a concrete example. When the RAN attack happened, 
Rand is the IDP site, the village where the Nigerian Air Force bombed, mm -hmm. you know, in error. Mm -hmm. Now, when we attempted to get to Rand, they couldn't provide security for us to go and do the on-the-spot assessment. So we now stayed in my degree, met with UN agencies, other uh, non-governmental organizations, the Borno State government, interviewed the chairman of the local government, went to the hospital to see the victims and were able to get information. But we could not get, you know, security escort to run. But months afterwards, when the uh, commissioner, UN commissioner for refugees came, he was given access to the place. And in fact, lo and behold, you know, Nigerian officials gave him all the information that they couldn't give to us. Yes, they gave all the information Why that they didn't have. Well, maybe they have more confidence in the international community or they have something probably Or is it a hide. case of he who pays the piper dictates the tone? Well, but we are the ones. It is, Nigerians, it is Nigerian government that pays, you know, members of its armed forces. You are I, a I'm member sure. of the All Progressive Congress, am I correct? Yes, I am. And there has been so much disarray and disagreements within your government. Even with an APC-led legislative arm of government and executive, why is it so difficult to find a synergy for the better good of the Nigerian people? Because we're looking at citizens and just wondering, these people we've elected into positions of power yeah, yeah. definitely do not represent our interests. They no longer put the good of Nigerians ahead of their selfish interests. Mm. So what can we do? Because we're living now in a hopeless society where people believe that they're suffering from insecurity, suffering from you know, lack of food and welfare. And now we can't even have hope in our leaders who we are going every four years to represent, who we're voting in every four years to represent us. Mm. What's the way forward? Sorry, just to wrap up. You know, even mm. within your, your party, what's the solution to mm. all these issues? How can we put a halt to it once and for all and move on as a country and develop at the speed that countries like African countries like Rwanda and Ghana are developing at? Well, um, my own take on that is I have x-rayed all the parties, including my own party, which is the ruling party, the APC. And I've discovered that there is no effective resolution, conflict resolution mechanism inside these parties. And you must have, you know, the world of the 21st century had since embraced, you know, dispute resolution mechanisms, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, so that went to courts and so on. Because there will continue to be squabbles, there will continue to be disagreements, you know, and discordant views on approaches. And the lack of clear court ideology to guide the parties has also accentuated you know, these uh, conflicts within the parties. Now, it is very unfortunate that in the case of the APC, just like it has happened to the PDP and other parties, you discover that the various levels of government, government functionaries, and even the arms of government are working at cross purposes. That's what we are witnessing between the executive and the legislative arms of government, for instance, at the federal level. Now, the legislatures at the state levels have since been pocketed, you know, by the executive governors. Mm -hmm. The local government system has completely been overrun, you know, by the, by the law. And unconstitutionally too, and we are all here. And there is no intervention at any levels to insist that, no, you must allow this, you know, local governments. Everyone must act according to the constitution. It is the wisdom of the framers of the Constitution to have three layers of government. But we have seen others using even extra constitutional powers to hold people to ransom. I am talking about the governors in this case. Nigerian governors, even before the APC government, they have always made sure that they pocket the local government system, they overrun it by making sure that all elected officers into the local governments are their own appointees. I think Nigerians yeah. don't mind seeing a disagreement when it comes to uh, the 
politics, the policies yeah. and the laws that the, between um, the legislative and the executive in terms yes. of preferring and you know differing. But mm. what our major concern is is the mm. ability to do your job. Yeah. It seems like in this eighth assembly, particularly, it's been hamstrung. Yes, it's been almost impossible. Mm. You know, we're talking about the oversight of the IDPs. Mm. As the chairman, you're saying that it's been practically impossible for you to see through, yes. you know, any of this working with the executive arm of government. So Nigerians mm. are worried. Mm. So your parting shots, um, I want you to tell me what can Nigerians do? Mm. Because it seems like the leaders we've elected are helpless. Mm. So what can we do to enable or to checkmate you guys or to encourage you to do your job um, in this administration is to insist that the right thing has to be done is to insist you see sovereignty according to the nigerian constitution lies in the people of nigeria but we don't take you know account of that we don't enforce that so nigerians must insist insist through legal processes through all the processes that are allowable to demonstrate our sovereignty and to insist that our leaders must act according to our own wishes and dictates, based on reason, rationality, as well as wisdom. That's a fine place to leave it. Thank you so much, Honorable you. Sani Zor, for Thank your you. time. So Thank that's you. the program, but we'll take a short break. And when we come back, we'll speak to you about some of the development projects the Osasu Shino Foundation has embarked on. Don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back on the Osasu Show. The Osasu Show Foundation specializes in providing education scholarships to underprivileged children as well as startup capital to women to start small to medium scale businesses. I want to thank the Sashu Show Foundation for the encouragement and support. I, Idris Ibrahim Halilu, the coordinator in charge of governmental and public relations, is saying a big thank you to the Osasu Show Foundation that deemed it important on, on this, uh, during this festive period to come to our children and uh, play with us. Children have been sent to school. The impoverished lives of women and their families have been changed through direct empowerment. Shelters have been built for the homeless and makeshift classrooms for the IDPs. That's it for today's program. To watch extended clips from this interview, you can visit our website, tostvnetwork.com. Don't forget, our initiative, The People's Candidate, is still very much alive. You can visit our website, forward slash TPC, to nominate who you want to be president in 2019. Follow us on social media, at The Osasu Show, at TOSTV Network, at Osasu Ignatian, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'll see you same time, same place next week, and until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you. <laughs>